Hello, good, good morning, um, and maybe good afternoon and good evening, depending where you are. Right, I'm going to be talking about uh, uncertainty from sampling. And the overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about is that sampling really is part of the measurement process. It's not been considered so for, uh, for, for half a century, but we're now realizing it's an essential part. And we have to think about it in a quantitative way not just in a descriptive way. And um, so the uncertainty that we generate in sampling, um, it contributes to the measurement and certainty. And this is now recognized in the ISO uh, 17025. So I'm going to talk about how to estimate uncertainty from sampling and hence measurement uncertainty. I'm gonna discuss a worked example uh, for lead in topsoil. Um, this is ex situ uh, measurements, but it also applies to in situ measurements. And I'll like, mention that a little bit. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the advantages of knowing uh, measurement uncertainty that includes uncertainty from sampling, more reliable compliance decisions, and judging the fitness for purpose of the whole measurement process instead of just the analytical part for validation. And I'll give a little example of, of how you'd apply this to nitrate in lettuce uh, as a bit of a precursor to a, the breakout session this afternoon. And then some conclusions. So Vicky, I think, uh, explained very clearly how sampling is in this measurement cycle a, a key part. So I think hopefully everyone agrees with that. Um, the, about, the material I'm going to talk about is mainly described in this Eurochem guide on uncertainty from sampling that was published in, in, in 2019. And it's got six worked examples um, for food, uh, feed, water, soil, and it's been applied widely to all sorts of different materials, gases, fuels. Um, ah, there we are. Um, the most widely uh, uh, applied approach um, in the guide, four of the six examples, use this thing called the duplicate method using a balanced design uh, and it needs only one sampler and i'll focus on that but there is a more sophisticated approach um, using the sort of interlab approach multiple samplers um, sampling proficiency data i've got a, one little slide on that that i might have time for and collaborative trials in sampling for validation which i'll mention so um, you all know, I think, what measurement uncertainty is, but I'm going to use uh, a, a, an old definition here that um, an estimate attached to a test result, the blue one here, that characterizes the range within which the true value is asserted to lie. So what we're trying to do is estimate this blue line here, and we never know where the true value is, but we need to know where it might be. And of course, true value is equivalent to value of the measure rand in the more recent definitions. The uncertainty from sampling is mainly caused by the small scale heterogeneity of the analyte within the sampling target. So it's in, uh, inescapable. Um, so I think the take home message in a way is the person responsible for the measurement needs to consider the quality of the primary sampling. We can't, we can no longer separate the two out and say that's nothing to do with me. Um, it has to be doing with someone. Um, it's not just the chemical analysis. So the primary metric for expressing the quality of the whole measurement, I think, is, is the measurement uncertainty. And that's the way to judge the fitness for purpose of the whole measurement process. So we've got to make the uh, estimate of measurement uncertainty realistic to include uncertainty from sampling. Otherwise, if we just use the analytical measurement uncertainty here, for example, we'd exclude the idea that the true value could be right up here. So we need it to include it. So sampling, uh, the first step of the measurement process, it can be at the macro scale. This is me taking samples, soil samples years ago. It can be these days made with in situ measurement devices. Here's a PXRF and people just putting it down and pressing a button at the, uh, at the micro scale. Uh, and they're actually really taking a sample, though they don't remove it. 
So sampling uncertainty from all these procedures uh, is included in the uncertainty value, even at the microscopic level. Here's a five micron beam sized uh, mass spectrometer. It takes picograms uh, and you get the same problem, even worse, probably at that level. So physical sample preparation, um, filtering, sieving, drying, storing, sieving, grinding, splitting, they're all part of the measurement process too. And we really need to include them in the uncertainty estimation for validation and for ongoing quality control. Too much has just been focused on just what goes on in the chemical lab. So here's an overview of the measurement process taken from the Eurochem guide. Um, it's not just this white bit, the, the analytical bit, there's all these gray bits the, where the sampling and sample prep goes on. And we've got to get our terminology right here. The first thing is to define this thing, the sampling target that the sample is meant to represent. So here, for example, is a bay of uh, 12 to 20,000 lettuces that I'm going to talk about later. Um, and what we're going to try and do is estimate the mean concentration across there, and we're going to take a tenfold composite. So sampling, the primary sample might be a composite sample, and it often is, and the number of increments in the complement in the composite sample will be very useful in controlling uncertainty. So when is sampling part of the measurement process? Well, when you're trying to analyze, estimate the analyte concentration in the sampling target, and I could just give you the definition here, portion of material at a particular time that a sample is intended to represent. So it could be a batch of food, an area of soil, a body of water. And this situation, you definitely need uncertainty from sampling in. There are occasions when people solely define the uncertainty that in terms of the lab sample and exclude the measurement uncertainty from sampling. But I would say that most users of the analytical measurement think that when you give report a value with an uncertainty, that that applies to the target, not just to the sample that came through the door. So in terms of ICU 17025, it's now explicit that in the measurement uncertainty estimation, you should include the uncertainty arising from the sampling. And when you're performing testing, again, you need to include uh, the uncertainty arising from sampling. So the best way to explain this really is with a, an example. So here is an example taken from the Eurochem guide where we use the duplicate method to estimate the uncertainty from sampling in soil. So uh, this is a former landfill in West London. Um, for potential housing development. And the measure and is the total lead concentration in the sampling target. This is near Heathrow, by the way. So the area of investigation is a 300 by 300 meter area with a depth of 15 centimeters. We defined 100 sampling targets across the area in a regular grid, 10 by 10, and 100 primary samples were taken with an auger intended to represent each of these targets. So here's the auger taking samples. And the duplicate method means that at 10% of the targets and at least eight, you don't just take one sample, you reinterpret the protocol to take a second sample. And this difference here gives us some idea of the sampling repeatability that feeds into the sampling uncertainty. And to separate out the analytical sources, we take analytical duplicates on both samples and we select the targets to do this on at random. The distance between the sample duplicates in this survey was three meters because our surveying technology at that point tapes and lines we couldn't relocate ourselves better than that. So it reflects the ambiguity in the sampling protocol. How different could the sample have been if a different sampler had been interpreting those same results? So it's a, a bit analogous to analytical methods. The sampling prep and analysis was pretty uh, routine, sieving, drying, acid digest, ICP with full quality control. Six 
CRMs we use to estimate analytical bias over a range of concentration. Reagent blank correction was used where necessary. Importantly, the results weren't truncated in any way. Uh, they weren't truncated at the detection limit or rounded. Um, if you do have rounded results, you'll get a distorted view of the uncertainty. So you really need to get the unrounded values from the lab. This is a map of the results uh, of the 10 by 10 grid. The values here are the lead concentrations in milligrams a kilogram. They vary from around 60 to around 4,000 and they straddle the then UK threshold of 500 milligrams a kilogram that's required for taking action for further risk assessment. And a deterministic look at this site says only 8% of the site is contaminated, 92%, most of it is uncontaminated, but this won't be the same when we look at uncertainty. But let's, how do we do the uncertainty? Here are the analytical duplicates, of the yellow sites chosen at random. And here are the results from the 10 targets that were replicated. Here's a design, here's sample one, the two analyses, sample two, the two analyses. You can see that the analytical replicates generally agree quite well, but you can see that there are some large differences between sample duplicates, and this reflects the heterogeneity on this site. But before we do more statistics, we need to inspect the frequency distribution to see what we're dealing with. So these are the lead concentrations expressed as a histogram across the site, all 100 locations. And you can see we've got a very skewed distribution here. And when we do log transformation, this is taking logs of the values, concentration values to the base E, we can see it becomes almost normal. So this means it was log normal in the first place, and that's going to have implications for the analysis of variance. So analysis of variance needs an approximately normal distribution. We can use robust analysis of variance when there's only up to 10% outliers, and I'll refer to that later, but this isn't the case here. And there's one other issue, and that is when here are the original results, and here are the log transforms, and you can see they're not in the concentration units anymore. So we need a new way of expressing uncertainty. And this is where we need the uncertainty factor, where SG is the standard deviation of these, these log transformed values. We just take the exponential of that, and that's the uncertainty factor. And I'll explain how we use that to uh, get a confidence interval in a minute. The, uh, the uncertainty factor here, there's a Eurochem leaflet that explains this in more detail. So here is the output of the classical analysis of variance from this program, RANOVA3. It's available on the AMC website for free. Um, we get an expended relative uncertainty without log transform here, but we know that's unreliable because we got a, um, a log distribution. What we need here is this thing, the uncertainty factor on the bottom line for the measurement. And there are the components for analysis and sampling. This 2.62 is going to be useful. The output also gives you robust ANOVA and you get this value of 83%. You can see it's high, but we know we've got more than 10% outliers. So we really need to ignore that and just use this uncertainty factor. The, as a matter of interest, the analytical bias we estimated with the reference materials was only three and a half percent plus or minus one percent. And this had a negligible effect on this uh, uncertainty factor, but we included it. So um, what's the implications of an uncertainty factor of 2.62? Say for a typical measurement value of 300, here's the measurement value and here's the confidence interval. And you estimate the confidence interval, not by plus or minus, but by times and over uh, division. So the upper confidence limit here, you multiply 300 times 2.62. And for the lower confidence limit, you divide by 2.62. And you can see this is asymmetric. Um, it's basically plus 500 that way and minus 200 this way. So it reflects the skew in the normal distribution. Interestingly, if you, if you had just used, say, the robust estimate of the uncertainty, 
you get a symmetrical confidence interval here with plus or minus the uh, uncertainty, but you ignore this big area up here where the true value could be. So you really underestimate the uncertainty in a key area. And uh, Ricardo and I have used this to make probabilistic maps of uh, lead contamination across this site. I haven't got time to show them, but it turns out that it's instead of being 92% uncontaminated it's only definitely 46 percent uncontaminated so it's more than half likely to be contaminated so you can make more reliable compliance decisions um, i'm now going to give you an example um, of uncertainty estimation so uh, this is a, an example about nitrate in lettuce and it's taken from the eurochem uncertainty from sampling guide, and it's example A1, as you can see. So there's an EU threshold of four and a half thousand milligrams a kilogram for how much nitrate um, is the limit in any batch of lettuce. And the whole batch is uh, of 12 to 20,000 heads is called the, the sampling target. And um, um, ah, right, so the, uh, there's a, a current EU sampling protocol that specifies that you need to take um, 10 heads, which are technically called increments, out of this bay of up to 20,000 lettuces. And you make one single composite sample from each sampling target. Um, those 10 heads are, are, are then brought together, macerated and prepared. And the analytical procedure is HPLC, and that's already been validated in a collaborative trial. That's um, there's a reference to it down there at the bottom. And um, the uncertainty uh, measurement uncertainty for the chemical analysis was estimated to be around six uh, percent. But we need to validate the whole measurement and pre procedure, including the sampling and th that sampling prep I was talking about. So the um, and the measurement uncertainty is the key metric that affects the compliance decision. And it's, um, it's affected by all the metrics that we traditionally use in um, method validation, the precision, the bias, the limited detection working range, selectivity, sensitivity, ruggedness. They, they're expressed in a way in the measurement uncertainty of the final result, and we can judge the fitness for purpose using that. So, the question here is how much of that measurement uncertainty is arising from the sampling? And that's how we're going to then judge the fitness for purpose and decide how close it is to the target measurement uncertainty. So here is our um, batch of around 20,000 heads of lettuce. And here is the sampling protocol applied as described where you take 10 increments. These, uh, these green dots are the increments. So we take, we walk along here and take 10 increments. And um, that's the W that's specified in the, in, in, in the sampling procedure. But um, in the duplicate method, we need to take a duplicate sample that's equally likely within this uh, procedure. And the W could it just have easily been the other way around here. And you can see, um, that that's equally likely and what we did we took eight bays uh, uh, of lettuces to give us an idea of what's typical and we did this uh, replicate duplicate design on, on each of them so um there are the eight typical targets each sampled in duplicate and then we put all the results into analysis of variance um to separate out the uncertainty from sampling and from the rest of the measurement uncertainty and we use this program run over three um, there's a link to it here it's a free software from the analytical methods committee amc um, and we decided to use robust anova it can do robust or classical because it can accommodate up to um 10 outliers which was Roughly the case here, we can see we've got a roughly normal distribution with a, a few outliers on the ends. 
And the uncertainty it estimated was 16.4%, um, which was equivalent to the standard deviation of measurement of 360 milligrams a kilogram. And this is really the, the, the repeatability. Um, and it was dominated by uncertainty from sampling. The ANOVA tells you that it was 78% of the measurement uncertainty was coming from the sampling. So the main cause uh, of the nitrate heterogeneity within all the sampling targets was uh, the heterogeneity was the main cause of the sampling uncertainty. And the analytical repeatability um, in, given by the ANOVA was 7.6, which is pretty close to the 6% um, reported for the uncertainty of the analytical procedure um, in its validation. So to judge the fitness for purpose um, of the whole measurement procedure, um, we need to decide on the, the, the target uh, uncertainty we're trying to achieve. And this could be set in a number of ways. It could be just set externally, and it often is, let's say, an arbitrary 20%, and you could say 16% is less than 20%, so it's fit for purpose. Or a better way of doing it is to set the target uncertainty at the measurement uncertainty that minimizes the overall cost, which includes the consequences of incorrect decisions, not just the cost of taking the measurements. So this, this approach that is, is described in the, uh, in the Eurochem guide, um, we look at uncertainty um, against cost. So this blue line here is the cost of measurement. And in very high uncertainty measurements are quite cheap, but as you try and make them more and more, uh, more precise, less uncertain, the cost increases exponentially. Um, the other way around is the cost of the incorrect decisions. If you've got very low uncertainty, you make very few correct incorrect decisions. And as you let the uncertainty increase, the incorrect decisions get more and more likely. And there's an incorrect decision here where we have a false positive and we throw out a batch of lettuce that at that, this stage was worth around 5,000 pounds. So there's a balance to be struck between these two uh, effects. And if we add these two terms in the equation together and get an overall equation, it's got a minimum here where we've got um, um, a minimum cost against uh, what's an optimal uncertainty. So if we get our measurement uncertainty for the whole measurement system here, then this is minimized the cost and it's going to be closest for fitness for purpose by this definition. So this uh, um, approach I'm going to explain to the optimized uncertainty approach also allows you to decide how it's most cost effective to achieve this target uncertainty. You can either spend more on chemical analysis or you can spend more on sampling. And this procedure will tell you which is the most cost effective. So if we look at the actual example, the actual data from the lettuce example I was just explaining, you can see here we've got uncertainty against cost again. And with the actual uncertainty here is quite far away from the, uh, from the optimal. So our 360 measurement uncertainty, 360 milligrams a kilogram is way to the side. We've got an expectation of loss here of um, 800 pounds, where down at the optimal level, the minimum, the, the, uh, where the uncertainty is 184, would give us a cost of around 400 pounds per batch. And this is um, taking the relative uncertainty down to 18%. So what we need is to reduce the uncertainty from 360 to 180. So we're looking for an improvement factor of two. And because the measurement uncertainty is dominated by the sampling uncertainty, nearly 80%. The most cost-effective way to do this, especially given that the sampling is cheaper, is to 
improve the sampling. And we can look up um, sampling theory and it tells us that if we want to reduce the uncertainty from sampling by a factor of two, we have to increase the sampling mass by a factor of four. So this is suggesting here that rather than take 10 heads, we take four times more, 40 heads. So this was done. And when the, um, when the uh, 40 head uh, results were looked at, the measurement uncertainty had dropped, well, the sampling uncertainty um, had dropped from 320 to 180 by a factor of 1.8, which is pretty similar to the model. You wouldn't expect much closer than that agreement. Um, and in absolute terms, it's from 360 to 244, or relative terms, 16% to 11%. So it's quite close to the optimal value of 184, and with the expectation of loss is down from 800 to around 500, which is pretty close to the optimal. So this says that by reducing um, the, the uncertainty from sampling, we reduce the measurement uncertainty, we've got to this whole measurement system to be fit for purpose um, at this optimum uncertainty. And the details of this study are cited in this paper down here. So there is there's one even better way of estimating measurement uncertainty. And that, inclu that includes the bias between different samplers, and that's to use data from a sampling proficiency test. And an example uh, was published here in 2011, where the sampling target, was, which was a, a fresh butter, a couple of hundred tons, we had nine samplers sampling the same thing. They each took duplicate samples and they each were analyzed in duplicate in the balanced, uh, you know, in the, like the duplicate method, but we had it across nine different samplers. So if we just look at single samplers, the estimate of the uh, measurement uncertainty that any one of them would have given was 0.39, very percent, very precise because it's the gravimetric determination of moisture. But when we look at the results from the sampling proficiency test, the estimate of uncertainty is 0.87, which is nearly 2.2 times bigger because it's including this bias between the samplers that is normally uh, undetectable. You may think that's just due to a, a few outliers, but when we looked at the Z scores uh, of these two samplers, uh, had Z scores above three and were rejected. But even if you reject those and you go down to seven samplers, the uncertainty is 0.69, which is still nearly twice as big as the uh, uncertainty um, that will be estimated for a single sampler. So um, it's a more reliable estimate of uncertainty because it includes this, this, this between sampler bias. Ideally, you could apply apply it over even more rounds of a sampling proficiency if the targets were comparable. And for example, sampling proficiency tests now have now been done on things like stack gas samples. There's a study here where there are 16 rounds of sampling proficiency test, and then you get a, an even better idea and you can monitor how the samplers are actually doing over a period at the same time. And if they all apply the same sampling protocol, that's really a collaborative trial in sample, and that's ideal for validating the actual sampling procedure that all the, the samplers are using. The downside, it's more expensive to apply than the duplicate method, but I think there are some cases where the consequence of uncertainty is so large that it's really justified. So finally, the conclusions. I think the important message here is that we need to include sampling within the measurement process, not as a separate uh, activity. And it's essential, it's essential to do this to get realistic estimates of measurement uncertainty that include the uncertainty from sampling. That would help conformity with 17025, as I've discussed, and enable us to judge the fitness of purpose of the whole measurement procedure, not try and do the sampling separate from the analysis. Um, 
Uncertainty from sampling can be estimated with the duplicate method, as we've seen. And the method I've shown, the duplicate method there, can be applied to any medium, soil, sediments, herbage, um, as, and waters, and uh, gases. So it's, it's, it's matrix independent. And it can even be applied to in situ measurement techniques, such as PXRF. And there's a PXRF being applied directly to soils. And there's a worked example here of uncertainty from sampling for um, in situ measurement in this paper um, from 2020 in the IMICO uh, volume. So if we have multiple samplers, we can get an improved estimate of the measurement uncertainty with sampling proficiency test, as I've just described. And once we've got this better estimate of measurement uncertainty, we can make more reliable compliance decisions. Um, because if, if we ignore the uncertainty from sampling, it's too small and we neglect false positives and false negatives. And it gives us this rig rigorous method, a way of um, validating the whole measurement procedure. So thank you very much for your attention and goodbye. <laughs>